Prayer is one of the things that forms us. We will be looking at that here at the Boulder campus coming up, but we have so far in our series seen how these other practices and habits are things that shape who we become. Things like reading God's word, how we relate to food and feasting and in fasting. We looked last week at rest and the whole idea of Sabbath. And all of these are things that help shape us into who we hope to become. And as Christians, who is that? Like Jesus. We are making choices in our lives and how we spend our time, what we give our attention and energy to so that we might be more and more like him. But here's the thing. All of those things are things we choose. But life has a way of throwing things at us that we would never choose. And those things can form us as well. One of the great pursuits of our life, it's even in our founding documents as a nation, is the pursuit of happiness. David Brooks is a New York Times columnist who a few years back, he observed how in a three-month period, Amazon had listed over a thousand new books on the topic of happiness. But if you think of the lives that you admire, you think about the people who are most remarkable, people who have lived impactful lives, chances are it's not just because they've simply been happy. You think about people like Abraham Lincoln, FDR. You think about Corey Ten Boom. You think about Helen Keller. Maybe there are some others in your mind. Chances are these are people who have experienced some great hardships, who have gone through great difficulties in their life. David Brooks in the same column, he said that people pursue happiness, but they feel most formed by suffering. Suffering is our topic for today. Suffering is that thing that we usually would never choose, but that sometimes finds its way to our lives. Suffering is a complicated topic, isn't it? I mean, first of all, just in this room right now, there are people who relate to suffering very differently. Some of us have experienced incredible, unspeakable tragedy in life. It's not like you've come through it and now everything's great, but you carry around with you the experience of going through that suffering, and it, it can still continue to be a very present pain in our lives. For others, though, suffering is something that really we haven't experienced. That's okay. Like, we just haven't really felt great pain in our lives. And for us, the topic may even seem kind of like academic, not even really relevant to life right now. But still for others, there are some right now, this is not academic, this isn't theoretical, you don't have to wonder what it must be like because you're in pain right now of some kind. Pain comes to us in all kinds of variety, doesn't it? There's just the pain of tragic loss. There can be the pain of losing a loved one or losing a relationship. There can be relational pain that comes from just a broken relationship. You might have the pain of being single and wishing you were married or being married and wishing actually that you were single. You have the pain of wayward children or the pain of not being able to have children. You have the disappointment of unfulfilled longings, unmet expectations. You have the pain that seems to be so prevalent in our day and age of isolation and the anxieties that seem to especially afflict our younger people in our society. Pain comes in a variety of forms, a variety of ways. And when we think of suffering, we, we might think, oh yeah, I've heard about this topic as the one where if you have a loving God who's all-powerful and good, then how can he coexist with a world that's full of pain and suffering? That is a worthwhile, relevant question, but that is not what we're going to be looking at this morning. Instead, what we're going to be looking at is in the face of suffering, how do we respond to it? And in the face of suffering, what outcome can we expect from it? Suffering comes in a variety of forms, but it also comes with a variety of causes. And we got to be really careful when it comes to the cause of suffering. There is a sense in which we could say all suffering comes back to the same point. 
Genesis 3 tells us about the, the rebellion of Adam and Eve against God and how pain and suffering enter the world through that. But the Bible says so much more about pain and suffering than just that. That is too simplistic of an answer for us to really address it. There are plenty of examples in Scripture of where suffering is attributed, though, to direct rebellion against God. In our most recent series out of Nehemiah, we looked at a text, at a passage in Nehemiah that talks about this. Nehemiah chapter 9 says, in spite of all of God's blessings, in spite of all of his favor for his people, it says, nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back and killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you, and they committed great blasphemies. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of their enemies who made them suffer. Is it possible that we would experience suffering because of rebellion against God? Yes, that is possible. But the Bible also includes another category that's not about direct rebellion against God. It's just a consequence of bad choices. The book of Proverbs is littered with examples here. Proverbs 13, 20, whoever walks with the wise will become wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. You hang out with the wrong people, and sooner or later, it will catch up with you. Maybe you should look around at who you're sitting by. Another example here is slothfulness casts into a deep sleep, and an idle person will suffer hunger. If you sit in your basement and play video games all day and never come up for air, it'll catch up with you. You can experience problems and pain in life. But there's yet another category, and it's the main category that I want to spend our time on this morning. And that's the kind of suffering that has no cause that we get to know about. It's the kind of suffering that just is. The Gospels have plenty of examples of this. Here are a couple. First of all, in John chapter 9, Jesus and his disciples... They pass by a man who is born blind. And his disciples asked Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. The disciples are operating with a framework that says, if somebody is suffering, it's because they have sinned. So who sinned in this man's case? And Jesus distances himself from that whole line of thinking. But he sees the opportunity and he heals the man on the spot, displaying the power of God in that moment. Luke 13 is another example. It says, There were some present at that very time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Pilate is a brutal man. He's a man who had killed, murdered Jews, and then mixed their blood with the sacrifices. And Jesus answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then Jesus even ups the ante and he raises another issue. He says, oh yeah, how about the tower that fell and killed the 18 people? Do you think those people were worse offenders than everyone else? What Jesus is saying is that we cannot link those who suffer the most with those who sin the most. The fact remains that there is plenty of suffering and pain in our world that gets no explanation to us. In that case, suffering often does not make sense. Suffering comes in a variety of forms, has a variety of causes, impacts us in a variety of ways, has a variety of these causes behind it. But the point is that suffering is a reality of life that none of us gets to escape. Suffering is a reality that none of us can escape. You might be thinking, yeah, but Perry, you don't know the people down the street. Like, they, their house is amazing. Their cars are incredible. Like, their family is beautiful. If you've been to one of their parties before, you would know. These people have escaped somehow. David Powelson is a counselor and a professor who wrote about this phenomenon of people who live long, healthy, abundant, prosperous lives. But even in their case, things may not always be exactly what they seem. He says, eventually, we will all experience a landslide of losses and disabilities. Live long enough and you may outlive everyone you love. You will outlive your usefulness in the workplace and other productive arenas. You may outlive your money. You may outlive your relevance and no longer be part of what's happening. You may outlive your health and every bodily system breaks down. 
Should you live long enough, you may lose every earthly good. Suffering and pain are realities of life that we cannot escape. So the question is, in a world of suffering, how do we respond to it? There are a lot of people in Scripture who experience great suffering and pain. We're going to look at the example of one person, King David of Israel. I'd like to invite you to turn to Psalm 13. David is a man who experienced all different forms of affliction in his life. Some of it was self-inflicted. Some of it was not. But he knew what it was like to be in the deep, dark valleys of life. And when we think of the book of Psalms, it's natural for us to think, oh yeah, these are the, the praises to God for those bright, sunshiny days. But the reality is that of the 150 Psalms, a third of them at least are called Psalms of Lament. If you're not familiar with that term, lament is when we cry out to God, asking God to intervene in our lives to change the circumstances we are experiencing. Lament is what we cry out, not on the bright, sunshiny days when everything is going great, but on the most difficult, darkest days that we experience. And David had plenty of those kinds of days. And as we look at his words, we can learn how to face our own days that are full of suffering. Psalm 13 begins this way. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Let's pause right there. Suffering has a way of knocking us off of our feet. It has a way of just completely disorienting our lives. And in the midst of that, one of our first reactions is to ask questions. And there are two in particular that get asked in pain and suffering. You can probably guess what they are. The first one is why. And the second is how long. There are plenty of examples of why in the Psalms. Psalm 10, why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Psalm 22, words written by David, quoted by Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Then later on, O oh God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Why is the question we naturally go to? But as we've already seen, why is often the exact question we don't get to know the answer to. Think of the entire book of Job, which is written to a man who's going through incredible suffering, and he does not get the same vantage point that we get as readers. He's never told why his suffering is happening. And even as readers, we still have our questions, don't we? But Job's companions around him are quick to jump to conclusions about why he's suffering, and they're all rebuked in the end for it. But suffering has a way of just sweeping us off of our feet. And David's question in that place is how long? How long is this going to last? And his particular complaint is, how long will you forget me? How long will you hide your face from me? David is claiming that God has turned his back away from him. I was talking with a woman this week who said that when her kids were younger, she had asked them, what do you wish was different about your relationship with mommy? And the child replied, mom, I wish I didn't have to look at the back of your head so much. Yeah, like a dagger, right? She, is so, she was so busy cooking meals, doing dishes, doing housework, and going off and going to work, providing for her family. And her child just felt like, yeah, you're, you're here, but you're not here. You're, I'm always looking at your back. David is saying that in the face of his own circumstances of suffering, in his own pain, that God has turned away from him. That God has turned his back and he's not paying attention at all to what's going on in his life. And in pain and suffering, doesn't it have a way of making us feel alone? When you're going through something really, really hard, don't you feel isolated? And that's exactly where David is at right now. 
We might read these questions, though, and think that, man, this sounds a little irreverent. But in fact, when we get into this area of lament, we have to understand the desperation of a person in lament is somebody who's like grabbing on, trying to cling on to hope for all of their life. And it's in that place we see that all of these complaints, all of these questions are actually enclosing something pure and beautiful. And it's David's faith. David isn't just broadcasting his complaints off into the air, hoping somebody will pick up the signal. What David is doing, though, is he's directing them very precisely at Yahweh. This word here, O Lord, in all caps, is the word that God had revealed himself to, to his people. This is the personal name of Israel's God, the God who had delivered them, who had protected them, who had provided for them over and over. And David is going to that specific person, that specific God at this particular moment because he knows that's the God who will listen. David is complaining. He's in agony, but he knows that this is the God who will hear. The first thing we do when we face suffering is we turn to lament. And the first step of lament is to take our questions and our complaints to God. We take our questions and our complaints to God. The alternative is to go quiet on God, which is not a good alternative at all. Mark Vrogrop is a pastor who has experienced great pain of his own. And in his pain, he has learned this, that giving God the silent treatment is the ultimate sign of unbelief. Despair lives under the hopeless resignation that God doesn't care, he doesn't hear, and nothing is ever going to change. The silence is a soul killer. David refuses to be silent, and he continues to go back to this God who he knows can be trusted, and he keeps going back with his complaints over and over but he doesn't stay there. The next step of lament, when we have given our complaints and, and asked our questions to God, is to then make our requests to God. That's what we see David do next. If we look at verse 3, he says, Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemies say, I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. David's plea to God is to consider. That word underneath in our English, the Hebrew word just means look, look to the God who is turned away. Look, look and answer me. Notice what's going on, God. See my circumstances. Understand my life. David is imploring God to take notice of him in all of this. People wonder what's going on in David's life at this point. We don't know. Is this when he's on the run from Saul? Perhaps. Perhaps. Some people speculate that he might be very sick and the enemy he's speaking against is actually the enemy of death. But whatever the case, David has gone from taking his, his questions and his complaints to God to now making his requests known to God. And again, what do we notice about those requests? They read like demands of God, but we see the faith that's underneath it all. Again, he's saying, considering an answer, consider and answer me, Yahweh my God. He's turning to God. He's not launching a complaint in one direction and looking for help in another. But he's going to God, asking for God to do what only God can do. Whenever we face suffering and pain in our lives, the way to respond that the Bible teaches us about over and over is to respond by turning to this practice of lament. The first step, again, is to take our questions and our complaints to God. And next, we give our our requests to God. We give our requests to God, asking for him to do what we need done in our life, to bring relief, to bring deliverance, to bring hope. And the final step of lament that we see in Psalm 13 is to fight with all of our lives to trust in the faithfulness of God. Here's what David does next. David says, but... I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. At this stage of lament, we often see the word but or the word yet. 
It's essentially saying that in spite of everything going on in life, in spite of all of the difficulty, all the pain, all the hardship, I will still trust you, God. David, in this case, says that I've trusted in your steadfast love. This is a loaded word. Steadfast love points to God's covenant faithfulness with his people. It points to the fact that this is the love that God has displayed over and over, time and time again. The love that is completely unconditional. The love that delivers his people. The love that hears his people. The love that understands his people. And the love that can rescue David in this moment. David is saying, past tense, I have trusted in that love but my heart shall rejoice in your salvation David is putting all of his trust in the faithfulness of God he hasn't yet experienced any change in circumstance from what it looks like we have no reason to believe that suddenly the clouds parted in David's life but by faith he is saying I have trusted in your steadfast love I've seen it I've seen it work its way through the way you've delivered our people in the past. I've seen it in my own life in previous days. And now I'm claiming that love in this moment, knowing that at some point, because of your faithfulness in the past, I can trust that one day in the future, you will bring about the salvation that I long for right now. That is what lament does, where we we put our trust in the faithfulness of God. Again, Mark Vrograp helps us with this, and he says that Christians affirm that the world is broken, that God is powerful, and he will be faithful. Therefore, lament stands in that gap between pain and promise. Lament stands in that gap. When we face suffering, we can turn to God faithfully ourselves by turning to lament. We lay our requests before God, we cry out to God, and we trust God to bring the deliverance that only He can bring. It's really neatly laid out in Psalm 13, isn't it? It looks like, oh, I just make my way through the six verses and I'm good. No. Lament is a very messy process. Lament is something we might have to enter into over and over and over again. There's no time frame for lament. David's asking how long, but it might be weeks, it might be months, it might be years where you feel like you are living out the lines of the psalm line by line by line. You might make your way partway through it and have to go back and start over again. This is a messy process. But Vrogop says that In the process, we can learn what he calls an active patience. It's an active patience, meaning that we don't know when deliverance will come. But we don't have to just wait passively in the meantime. We learn to wait actively by putting our faith into action, reminding ourselves of why we can actually trust in this God to deliver us. Lament is the practice that we can turn to when we face suffering and pain. But we still might wonder, when we experience pain and suffering, what outcome should we expect from it in our lives? What can we expect to come out of this, all of the trouble and the pain and the sorrow and the anguish in our lives? We could just say, first of all, that one of the outcomes of suffering is that we see the world differently than we did before. Suffering strips away the illusion that we like to live with, that we are actually in control of our lives. Suffering turns our world upside down so that we recognize we are not actually charting our own course through life. That it doesn't all depend on us. But hopefully as we face suffering and turn to lament, we learn that losing control of our lives does not mean our lives are out of control. We can trust in the almighty hand of God. Suffering changes the way we see the world. Suffering also can be useful in helping others who are also going through suffering. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, puts it this way at the start of 2 Corinthians. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. 
It's not that we want to go through the process of suffering, but if we do, when we do, we can expect that we might actually be able to help somebody else who's going through suffering themselves. Suffering also, though, has a way of producing in us things that it seems suffering is the only thing that can produce. If you look at Romans chapter 5, Paul says, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. James says something very similar. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of various kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Don't we have a need to persevere in our faith in life? Suffering has a way of producing that endurance, that steadfastness, that grittiness in our faith that it seems only suffering can do. But in an even bigger picture sense, suffering aligns our life with Christ. Suffering aligns our life with Christ. First Peter talks about this. Chapter 4, he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. The gospel message is built around this whole notion that we have a God who is not distant from suffering But we have a God who actually has experienced suffering, who subjected himself to suffering. But most importantly, we have a God who has overcome suffering. And what Peter is saying here is that because Christ has faced, encountered, gone through suffering and overcome it and been glorified, guess what, all of you believers? You can expect that you too will face suffering. You're sharing in his suffering in that way. But you will also one day share in his glory. That there's a hope beyond our suffering. We don't rejoice in our suffering just for the sake of suffering. But we rejoice in the outcome, the byproduct of what suffering can give us. Which leads eventually to being glorified like Christ. Peter, a few verses later, then says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Entrusting our souls to a faithful creator while doing good. The tagline for this series is that we want to walk in the likeness of Christ. Guess what that means? Walking in the likeness of Christ means walking in suffering. But the great hope we have here is that we can entrust our souls to a faithful creator in the midst of suffering. That's what this whole process of lament is all about. Learning how to entrust our souls to that faithful creator. The one who is sovereign over the universe and the one who himself has experienced what it's like to suffer and as yet has overcome it. If we want to be formed like Christ, then we need to just understand that suffering is a way that we are formed to be like Christ. God uses suffering in our lives to form us into the likeness of the one who suffered also for us. That is a part of what it means to walk with Jesus, but it's by his grace, the same grace, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead led to his glory is the same power that can be at work in us as well in the face of our own suffering. May we be a people who learn to suffer well. Let's ask for God's help in that. Father, this is beyond our ability. This is beyond our means, beyond our strength, beyond our ability to really even understand and comprehend Lord, we need you to intervene in our lives in the face of a world that is full of pain and a world that is full of suffering. God, we need your help to be able to carry us through. Some of us today are standing, Father, in that gap between pain and promise. 
I pray that you would meet us in that very place, Lord. Some of us are living, struggling to have hope because of the suffering we are experiencing, the disappointment we are experiencing, the way life feels out of control. God, would you minister to us in that place? Lord, we know that suffering is something that you have overcome, so may we be people who are hopeful. May we face suffering knowing that you have already provided a way through it. So God, may we learn to look to you most strongly and most clearly in the midst of our own pain. We're desperate for you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.